In the weeks prior to a pastor moving on from one congregation to another aspect of ministry, it is the practice of some preachers to offer up a kind of farewell discourse. Sort of like Jesus at the end of the Gospel of John. Peace I live with, leave with you, not as the world does. I will, I will excuse you from that maudlin experience. Instead, I'm looking at these last few weeks as a kind of victory lap. Even at the risk of sounding boastful. I do this deliberately. Because in an exit interview I had recently, the most serious criticism I had of this congregation is that you give yourself too much of a hard time. You, we aren't perfect. We don't do everything really well. We are a collection of human beings, but we are God's beloved people. We strive to follow Jesus. You are faithful and generous, and frankly, it's just not going to hurt you to take a victory lap or two. The lectionary texts for this morning give us ample opportunity to practice this. The beginning, the Old Testament lesson from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the gospel lesson ending at the very, very end of Matthew, Matthew 28. When we are told, go therefore to all nations. In a way, these texts might be suited to a victory lap. We start with God's creation of the world, and then we continue around to the marker, to the phrase, the words of Jesus, and then we just keep on going all the way into the future. However, there are some problems with the texts. There always are. Um, first, with the Genesis story. Um, scholars tell us that um, this story from the first chapter of Genesis is not the oldest of the creation stories. Um, it's not even one of the older parts of the Bible. In fact, Genesis 2, which has a story of God walking around the Garden of Eden with, with Adam and Eve, that's a much older story. Um, it derives from a very ancient myth. Genesis 1 was added later, after Israel had been established, after the temple had been built, after a king had been selected and a hereditary priesthood was established. And it has a kind of tone, a kind of imperial tone of having everything figured out. And indeed, at that time in history, it must have felt that way to people in Israel, or at least the people in power in Israel who are responsible for the addition of this text. There's also some problems with the gospel text. This brings back memories to me because this is the passage I had to exegete in my ordination exams. Um, I've been struggling with this for a very long time. Scholars tell us that Jesus probably didn't say this in this particular way, but that it was added at a later date uh, to approximate the kind of teaching that Jesus would did give. You see, the biggest problem that the early church confronted was this question of ethnicity. That is, 
Should Christianity remain among the good and respectable Hebrews, God's chosen people, or should this faith reach out to the heathens and the pagans and to these unworthy people? Should we stay at home and clean up our own act here, or should we spread out to all the world? This was a question. And so these words were added by Jesus' disciples who knew him very well and knew about the kinds of teaching that he had taught to, to say that no nation, actually the Greek word is ethnos, so it's no people or no ethnicity, no ethnic group, no ethnos. There is no ethnos, no group, no ethnic identity that is to be excluded. It's not the nose with the, the, with the, uh, the, the water that pointed straight out. It's the broad mist that falls on everyone. So in these texts, we start, we've got like the whole cosmos, right? With Genesis 1, the heavens and the earth. And then we've got all peoples teaching them all I have commanded you. I mean, there's a lot of certainty in these texts. Maybe that's where we get some of our tendency to give ourselves a hard time. You see, I suspect that we might have a lurking suspicion that if we really were faithful, we would be able to enter these texts with the same certainty as the ancient Israelite temple hierarchy or the most intimate disciples of Jesus Christ. But let's get real. We aren't ancient bigwigs, and we are not Jesus' disciples from the first century. So we're just not going to have that kind of certainty necessarily all the time. But there is a place for us. And it's written right there in the text. And some doubted. And the doubters were not scolded or sent away. As one of my favorite theologians, Kurt Oliver, puts it, it doesn't say that those doubters were condemned to the lowest levels of hell. The, sim the text simply reports the doubting as fact. Fact like that the sun shines, the grass grows. And it's just one of the markers along our victory lap. We, we, we just, we, we encounter it, we recognize it, and we run past it as we continue our mission and ministry into the future. I'm glad that there's a place for us. And there's some of the... One of the things I need to tell you is that sometimes people think, when I get up and say, we're the church that doesn't have the answers, but we ask a lot of questions, and I say it's okay to doubt, and sometimes people think that I'm kind of edgy, theologically edgy by saying that. It's not edgy. In fact, I'm like surprisingly orthodox. I mean, this is just middle-of-the-road standard theology. It got written in the text, and some doubted. 
and we pass it and go on nonetheless. There are times in this congregation when I have been, that, 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 that's exactly what we've done. We've accepted the fact that we, we kind of have to risk it sometimes. We have to work on our intuition. We have to just go with our heart and our gut and hope that this is what God calls us to do. But there has been stalwart witness that I have been most appreciative to. I'm reminded that after I'd been here a few years, we had a, a donor, a member of the church, who gave quite a bit of money to the church. And he made it clear to us, he said to me, that if we, wouldn't, um, if we continued to insist on supporting and condoning homosexuality, he would no longer give any money to the church. I came back to the session to report this news. And the treasurer at the time smiled and said, how nice of him to give us warning so we can be prepared. <laughs> or on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, our uh, church member and theologian Bob Willis gave a lecture, a really distinguished lecture. When is war acceptable, if ever? And what was so good about it was that he went through just war theory and you kind of knew where he stood about this and he left room for the rest of us to make up our own minds to grapple with what we think is acceptable and right this is part of the preliminary principles of the Presbyterian Church and part of very strongly part of the Congregationalist and German Reformed tradition. It comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith from the 17th century that said, in matters in regards to religion, we consider private judgment to be inalienable. And this church has stuck by it. And even though we get clicky sometimes and, um, you know, can make those mistakes, the fundamental belief is that the mist falls on everybody, even if I disagree. Let us then continue in our victory laps and let us go in the present but on to the future recognizing all that Jesus has commanded us, knowing in truth that even though we doubt, God is with us. Jesus remains with us, lo, even unto the close of the age.